Approximately 96% of all the discourse that has ever taken place involving shonen anime and or manga has revolved around combat, with a solid 73% of those conversations having been started by some variation of the essential question, which anime fight guy is the fightiest? There are nearly infinite possible permutations of this query, any combat-based comparison between two characters is really just a granular aspect of it, but all of them are equally pointless because the answer is Arale, and it has been since 1980. Even when you ban Gag Manga Meta Knight from the brackets, though, the question doesn't get much more interesting, especially not now that Anos Voldigode exists. I absolutely understand why this conversation is so ubiquitous and unending. Anime fights are the apex of human artistic achievement, and once you've seen two or more anime, it becomes impossible not to imagine additional battles between your favorite fighters from them. And while we've all been busy expending words at each other, many of them quite cussy, over a topic that's mostly just fun to think about, we've left a lot of potentially fun to talk about ones languishing on the table. Like the fashion choices of our favorite anime heroes, which are often more fly than Goku fly fish from his flying Nimbus through the window of an airplane that's being carried by Superman, who could maybe beat Goku in a fight, but definitely not in a fit-off. And he's not even close to the drippiest Dragon Ball character. That'd be Piccolo in his iconic driving school ensemble, followed closely by Bulma in most of the things she wears, and then Future Trunks inherited her fashion sense to tie with Videl for third on the totally objective tier list that I just invented in my head. Hey! Look at that! We've already managed to pull four Z Fighters and friends into this conversation who'd hardly merit mention in a typical fight-focused fracas, and we've barely even begun. Whereas those arguments are so played out that one could predict the first 40 forum pages of any given death battle thread in a chess-style opening book, this conversational ground is so fertile and untrodden that I, a man who needs his girlfriend to dress him for the anime awards, can make meaningful contributions to it simply by gesturing toward clothing I enjoy, like Vegeta's Batman shirt. Finally, he beats Goku at something. And I don't even have to gesture outside the boys club bubble in which I'm most comfortable, even though this video would definitely be better if I knew anything about Sailor Moon. But instead, I can point to the Tokyo street-style savviness of its shonen contemporary Yu Yu Hakusho, which, in addition to raising the bar for writing and action in its genre, helped to forge a whole new bar made of gold in space on the fashion front. Sure, Dragon Ball had its stylish individuals to set it apart from the Mad Max chic of Fist of the North Star, but every single character in Yu Yu Hakusho is an entire look unto themselves. Even now, few shonen heroes can match the effortless, casual cool of Yusuke Urameshi. Kuwabara remains the quintessential boncho, or boss delinquent. Kurama constantly looks like he just swaggered off a runway. And even after three decades, most angsty sword boys are still playing catch up to Hiei, who don't need no fidget spinner belts on his iconic black trench coat. And on the girls' end of things, Botan's fits are all unquenchable fire. This is the one area where Yu Yu Hakusho still outdoes Hunter x Hunter. Besides creating the template for the perfect tournament arc, this increased focus on fashion may be Yu Yu Hakusho's single greatest contribution to the shonen battle genre, though Togashi didn't make that contribution alone. Three years before it started running, in 1987, Rumiko Takahashi accidentally invented horror anime with her answer to Dragon Ball, Ranma Half. And in that series, we get to see an eclectic collision between traditionally inspired Chinese martial arts attire and comfy casual 80s Tokyo streetwear, resulting in what are still some of the cutest girls' fits in any boys' manga ever, especially Shampoo, but especially, especially Ronko. Also in 1987, Hirohiko Araki began JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, bringing his impossibly dapper Victorian gentleman and later World War II-era Indiana Jones-inspired adventurers to the pages of Shonen Jump. That said, it would take the series a couple time skips to catch up to current trends in 1989, and even when he began working with modern styles, Araki continued marching to the bizarre beat of his own drum. 
While you will not find a more iconic anime Boncho than Jotaro Kujo, he's anything but quintessential. The huge gold chain, colorful zigzaggy belts, and gold-buttoned hat that becomes hair at some indeterminate point on his skull all mark his aggressively customized school uniform as high fashion an aesthetic that permeates all of Araki's work. In JoJo's world, everyone just hits the streets like models hitting the runway, right down to the statuesque posing. Each character possessed of their own wholly unique sense of style that perfectly matches their personality. Not every outfit's a winner, but the vast majority of them are, and Araki's designs have only gotten bolder and more beautiful with each subsequent installment. Perhaps one could argue that he peaked with Rohan Kishibe and Jolene Kujo. There is a reason they were the focal point of his Gucci collabs, but the fact that he's done Gucci collabs kinda says everything right there. When it comes to fashion in anime and manga, Hirohiko Araki's only real competition is himself, and he's never stopped trying to one-up that jerk at every turn. No shonen drips harder than Jojo, only differently. Yu Yu Hakusho drips differently. And because its approach to drawing on current trends is a lot easier to emulate than the incomprehensible genius of Araki's artwork, you tend to see more anime that drip like it, or like it would if it were drawn now. Even the creators of manga whose settings don't support modern fashion, like One Piece, will indulge themselves on occasion, or many occasion, with art spreads reimagining their characters in street clothes and other fancier modern attire. When Oda's asked to do a fashion magazine cover, he goes all out. Actually, I could write an entirely separate video about One Piece's sometimes cartoony pirate fashion, and probably will at some point in the future. Characters in One Piece change outfits with impressive regularity, it's got its own in-universe labels, it's got Brook, and Nami, and Robin, and Usopp. Heck, Oda's even thought about the individual fashion sense of each of the Straw Hat pirates, and how some, Luffy, need a little help from others to not look like their mom picked out their swashbuckling attire. To loop back to Jojo, though, Sorry, One Piece tends to distract me. There are some other recent-ish shonen things with their own elevated sense of style. Shaman King springs to mind. Even as a kid who knew less than nothing about anything related to fashion, I could tell Yo Asakura had it going on in a way that the heroes of most of my favorite other anime at the time definitely did not. And his Nakama and foes alike were equally styling. By the way, Holy Metaroli, I am so excited for that reboot. You may have noticed I said most just now, because there is one other anime franchise I loved as a kid that had drip for days, blending then-modern punk style with a cyberpunk twist and a little bit of Egyptian bling for flavor. That's right, I'm talking about Yu-Gi-Oh!, which in its heyday featured some of the dopest fits in anime, period. There has never been a better-dressed man fictional or otherwise, than Seto Kaiba, though Yami Yugi comes pretty close, especially when he stops using his sleeves. But really, just about everyone in the original anime looks great. Joey makes the simple t-shirt and jeans look work, Bakura rocks that striped undershirt button-up combo, Pegasus oozes as much class as he does generally creepy vibes, Merrick looks great in both his mad villain cape and that cool hoodie vest thing, and he's got just enough too much gold on. And then his sister Ishizu's dress is breathtaking in at least a couple ways, and with those hair accessories, she looks gorgeous veil on or off. My Valentine's fit was a favorite of mine when I was younger for, uh, entirely unesthetic reasons, but also I think the lace-up tube top, mini vest, matching skirt, and detached sleeves look fantastic on her in as non-thirsty a way as my terminally male brain can process. And of course, the ever-changing outfits of Taya Gardner can't be ignored either, from the cute pink vest she wore on Duelist Kingdom all the way up to the ponytail look she sports in Dark Side of Dimensions, she, uh, wears a lot of stuff that makes it hard to think about style. What I'm trying to say is that Kazuki Takahashi is a low-key master of horny fashion in a way that probably deeply affected me in my formative years, though at least he's equal opportunity with it. Don't worry, Serenity. You're in good hands with Duke Devlin. Very good hands. 
He wasn't as hands-on with the character design in later Yu-Gi-Oh! entries, but his aesthetic sensibilities still informed those series' designs in very positive ways, at least early on in the franchise's history. I'd say that GX is probably the peak of Yu-Gi-Oh! fashion, simply because all of the Duel Academy's uniforms have a vague Kaibaness to them. Even some of the teachers got style to spare. And the series has Kaiba Man, who's just Kaiba but with a blue eyes white dragon helmet, which, scientifically speaking, makes him more Kaiba than Kaiba, and thus the flyest Yu Gi Oh character by default. Things went a bit downhill with 5Ds. The cyberpunk biker garb is just a little on the busy side, though it does fit the series' very extra setting, and Akiza and Jack Atlas, at least, are still decently drippy, which becomes increasingly harder to say about any character from Zexel onward. It feels like the series started ignoring real trends altogether in favor of accentuating its own yu gi -osity, and it increasingly does not work. Then Sevens went way too hard in the other direction and just ended up looking like a generic Yu-Gi-Oh knockoff. But I am trying to make a mostly positive video about shonen anime drip here, not continue my TED talk on the decline of modern Yu-Gi-Oh, so let's take a quick break from the card game ad for an entirely different kind of ad before we shift gears to something that still has style. This video is brought to you by ExpressVPN. As of 2021, still the best VPN you can get according to TechRadar, CNET, Tom's Guide, and other tech experts. Now, I'm no expert, you should see the computers I've built, but I still feel ExpressVPN's consistently blazing fast, best-in-class speeds in my bones when I'm connecting to the web through their premium servers in 94 different countries. And as a non-expert, I deeply appreciate their easy-to-use one-click apps available on most devices you can name, and their 24-7 customer support live chat, which lets me get answers to any questions I might have in seconds, which is especially valuable because for any wannabe tech experts who are watching this, they also offer a really versatile tool set that allows you to install ExpressVPN on your router and tunnel traffic from your game consoles, smart TVs, or other unsupported devices through ExpressVPN. So not only can you use their service to connect to Netflix Canada with a single click and binge Ghibli movies to your heart's content, you can enjoy those family classics with your family in the comfort of your living room without needing a fancy entertainment center PC. To see for yourself what makes ExpressVPN so special and find out how you can get three months free, just click the link in the doobly-doo or head to expressvpn.com basement today. A lot of people have a lot of feelings about how Bleach went down, but there's not a single soul on this planet who will tell you that Tite Kubo's fashion game ever declined. From its inception, Bleach had the best-dressed characters in modern manga, each decked out in constantly rotating, street-savvy attire. One almost suspects that Kubo had more fun dressing these characters than he did using them in stories and fights. His imagination when it comes to fashion-forward fits is unparalleled. On every splash page, in every OP and ED, Bleach's characters are dressed to the nines, getting out in get-ups that would make any Tokyo trendhopper salivate. And on top of that, the series features some of the slickest fantasy fashions out there. Every Captain of the Soul Society is a style icon. It helps that their uniform, with the white haori over the black shihakusho, is so inherently striking and cool, but each one makes it their own by accessorizing, doing their hair up, or just wearing it different. The rank and file Soul Reapers look pretty damn good in their own right, too. The simple black uniform's nothing to sneeze at, and Ichigo wears it especially well. I also like the contrast with what the Arankar wear, both in terms of how the uniforms are colored and shaped. They wear Western-style button or zip-up jackets over their white hakama, as opposed to the traditional Japanese black kosode of the Shinigami. As I mentioned in my Fave Fights of 2020 video, Tite Kubo's proven he's still got it with Burn the Witch, and it's really cool watching him break away from the style of Tokyo and Harajuku to draw on London's fashion scene instead. But in talking about that, I'm pulling the conversation toward the current state of Shonen Drip, and before we get there, I want to take some time to appreciate a different show about style and Shinigami, Soul Leader. There are two types of clothing in anime. Forever clothes, the cool getup your hero Naruto's around in for all of his life, or until a time skip gives him a redesign, 
and actual clothes that human beings would change out of and throw in the wash regularly. Typically, manga whose heroes change their clothing tend to be more fashion conscious, which makes sense if you think about it. If you're thinking about that stuff as a writer, you probably have some interest in it as an artist, too. You're inclined to design fashion. Whereas if you think of your heroes as heroes in costumes that you draw, well, Naruto sure does wear a neon orange jumpsuit. Not saying it's not a look, just that it's a look. Naruto has a strong personal brand. Every character in Soul Leader also has a strong personal brand. Their clothing is so tightly tied to their designs that their characters could not exist without it. What would Death the Kid be without the majestic symmetry of his, uh, his dad's face jacket to offset the striking asymmetry of his hair? What are Patty and Liz without their perfectly mismatched va va voom cowgirl getups? Without that gangsta fit, how are we supposed to know not to fuck with Soul? The only other thing he can exist in is a satanic zoot suit. And yet, that zoot suit is fly as fuck. As is his regular tracksuit. Blackstar's outfit is loud. As loud as it can go, and it goes to 11. It's all the ninja. Wow, Black Star, very cool. But it is not, I cannot stress this enough, a neon orange jumpsuit. This, my friends, is a look. The flared collar highlights his on-brand hairstyle perfectly. His tank top and pants are just the right level of baggy, accentuating his muscles and long legs. The gloves are your perfect one allotted accessory. The bolted on metal ninja scarf is exactly too much enough. This is the fit of a man who knows he's amazing and is just waiting for the time he doesn't fail to prove it to everyone. Black Star drips. The entire cast of Soul Eater drips in ways that anime characters designed around their costumes rarely do. I am continually amazed by the level to which these clothes work. Maka might be the coolest shonen protagonist. And then, on the other hand, in a show that has both forever costumes and normal clothes, there's Deku. Look, I love superhero costumes. I think My Hero Academia has very cool superhero costumes. Horikoshi clearly studied the heck out of some quality Spider-Man stuff. But cool superhero costumes, as we established with my diss on Superman at the start of this video, are not fashion. Unless they're Edna Mode originals, or worn by non-Peter Parker spider people, or Mina Ashido, obviously. And neither are most of the casual fits in Hiroaka. Like, Mina, Kaminari, and Jiro are the only characters who show any personality or sense of style in their choice of clothing. Himiko Toga's whole thing is just being messy on purpose, and she's still got one of the strongest looks simply by virtue of having a thing at all. Most of the characters just look dorky, whether they're out on the town, lounging around in the dorm, in class, or going to a fancy party. Even the class bullies a dork. And that makes sense. They're in a top prep school for super cops, two of the dorkiest conceivable institutions. But then most of the villains are pretty dorky too. Like Stain is just a psychotic All Might nerd wearing all of the Ninja Turtles laundry at the same time. Mr. Compress is the most strikingly stylish member of the League of Villains, and he is literally a magician. Overhaul almost had something going on with the ornate plague mask and purple faux fur lining on his green jacket, but then he had to go and ruin it with the white work gloves that match his shoes that match his tie. After Labor Day, ugh. To be clear, Hiroaka's got incredibly strong visual design in most other departments. You'll just find better fits for its characters in a lot of fan art. And that's fine, because plenty of modern shonen are picking up the slack for its lack of decent slacks. It's 
It's a terrible line, but I, I felt compelled to include it. Black Clover, for example, has some of the coolest Western fantasy clothes I've seen in anime. Even in the first episode, both Asta and Yuna have a clear sense of style, and the mini wizard cloaks they get when they join their respective squads perfectly complete their respective looks. Those cloaks are straight up genius, in my opinion. Just big enough to give every squad mate a uniform look, while leaving plenty of room for individual stylization, both in how the characters choose to wear them, and what they wear under and over them. They're every bit as brilliant as the Soul Reaper uniforms, which is saying a lot. I could, and maybe will at some point, make a whole video just talking about fantasy military uniforms and stuff like that, FMA, Attack on Titan, Seraph of the Edge, and Valkyria Chronicles, then maybe diss Naruto a little bit, because like the headbands are cool, but like, man, if you ever wore one of those to school, you know those headbands are not cool. You see the former two of those everywhere at anime cons for good reason, though. On the subject of uniforms, Jujutsu Kaisen's school uniform game is exceptionally on point in a tastefully low-key way. From Yuji's comfy red collar to Toge's turtleneck to Kugisaki's belt, which really accentuates her figure perfectly, to Satoru Gojo's eye wrap, everyone accessorizes just enough to distinguish themselves without undermining the fundamentally simple style of the uniform itself. Except Megumi, who does nothing with it, which is also perfect accessorization, because he is canonically very boring, and everyone else being not boring makes his boringness stand out as interesting. That's an important thing to remember. Fashion game is a metagame. You gotta pay attention to what the other players are doing, if only so you can more confidently ignore it like Satoru Gojo does, still wearing his school uniform and making it work, despite working as a teacher. And then on the flip side, you've got Nanami, rocking that salaryman chic, dotted tie, excellent choice, and those goggle glasses add just the right level of strangeness to the ensemble. Like Bleach, these characters also look great in their off days. The whole first ED is just them doing a casual fashion show, conveying their personalities to us solely through style and body language. Kugisaki showing us that she's got both impeccable, understated taste with the simple overall ensemble, and also that she's got a hyperactive too much gene with all those shopping bags, which she knows how to carry, and preemptively styled that simple outfit to complement. Great taste, and golly, she's cute. Though not quite as cute as Satoru Gojo, whose entire dance sequence screams one inescapable fact at your face. This guy fucks. The other modern pillars of Shonen Jump are a little less modern in their sensibilities, yet no less drippy in their execution. Demon Slayer, for instance, has permanently raised the bar for yukata and kimono designs in anime and manga, with its seemingly endless array of gorgeous, eye-catching patterns. Some fits, like Tanjiro's and Nezuko's, are understated yet effective, while others, looking at you, Shinobu, will never stop looking at you, Shinobu take the entire idea of traditional Japanese clothing in radical new directions. And then there's Kibitsuji Muzan, whose style, as is only appropriate for an immortal vampire king, or the king of pop, is truly timeless. Dr. Stone's style, meanwhile, is anything but. It don't get more retro than this inspired fusion of traditional Japanese elements, modern Tokyo fashion, lab coats, and caveman loincloths. Gen Asagiri deserves to be a fashion icon. Senku's personal brand is as strong as brands get, though nobody else could pull it off. Tsukasa makes the whole primeval warlord thing look simultaneously brutal and elegant, and every single girl's outfit manages to be fresh and unique while simultaneously proving Kiyoshi from prison school's groundbreaking thesis about human evolution. You know the one. Dr. Stone's artist, Boichi, is a certified booty genius. The Promised Neverland is, very thankfully, about as far from that stylistic school as you can get. And you may not think of it as stylish, but think again. 
Its characters do, for the most part, only wear one thing in two gendered variations, but that one thing is striking in its elegant, timeless simplicity, as is Isabella's nunnish uniform. Emma and Ray are due for some very good costume changes in the near future of the anime, and where we're at presently, Sanju and Mujika both sport quality fantasy fits. I especially love the cascading, interlocking layers of her robe. Also, there's a whole other layer of fashion meta to get into with the demon's masks, but we're starting to run pretty long, and uh, I should make another Promise Neverland video. I could keep going basically forever. This is an infinite topic, and speaking of infinity, Skate the Infinity's cast is packed end-to-end -end with instant icons. Eye's yellow hoodie in Wonder Egg Priority is perfect. Kimono Jihen's got a spooky sort of drip going on. Horimiya is basically about personal style. The girls in Other Side Picnic look great and complement each other perfectly. The ones to watch for Winter 2021 alone could double this video's length. And every show I've already mentioned deserves to be picked apart with far greater analytical depth than its own exhaustive video essay, which, speaking honestly, I'm probably not equipped to make. But my goal today was only to take an inert ball that I think could do some serious rolling and give it a little influencerly push. I'm hoping that more fashion-minded folks in the comments and other anime essayists, video and otherwise, will be able to render everything I've just said conversationally obsolete inside a month or two. Three questions to help get that started. One, what anime do you think has the most style? Two, which shonen character is the drippiest of them all? For bonus points, answer this question in the form of a tier list. And three, what anime fantasy world do you think has the best fashion overall? Let me know down in the comments, and please argue with each other about it. Without being toxic, we're trying to have fun here. Please argue with me, too. I was definitely way too mean to Deku. You can also at me on Twitter if and when you've made a video of your own. Oh, and if you have time, maybe check out these videos of my own. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.